If you have your Bible this morning, let me invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37 is our text of Scripture. And as you turn there to Luke chapter 10, I want to remind you that we are in a series together called Life Lessons. We are looking at the parables of Jesus. We're taking various parables as we go through this series together. And we're asking God to speak to us as we think about these parables. You'll remember that Jesus is, is taking something that is an earthly story, and he's able to connect it to kingdom principles. And so we're learning all kinds of things about kingdom life and, and also about the people that Jesus was speaking to as he lived upon the earth. But the parable that we're looking at this morning, I would say, is probably one of the most familiar parables in all the Bible. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And it's one of my favorite parables. I'm so glad that we have made it to this particular parable together in God's Word because God has so much to say to us. It's my prayer. It was the, the longing of Jesus that we would follow the example of the Good Samaritan. So hopefully you have found Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. Our parable says these words, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to them, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for this parable that calls us to action. It calls us to look up and to look around and to see opportunities and needs and to do what we can through your power to meet them. Lord, we pray that you'd speak to us as we open ourselves to you, our hearts and our minds, as we open our lives to you, God. We pray that in these moments that you would speak to us. It's our prayer. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. As we look at our world, we do not have to go very far to find people who are in need. People all around us have psychological needs. They have physical needs. They have emotional needs. Uh, we find spiritual needs and, and all kinds of needs around us. As we think about South Louisiana right now, we, we can look to the, the east, we can look to the west, we can look all around us, and, and we find people that have been impacted by hurricanes. You know, the early ministry of Christ was one that was deeply interested in those who lived in desperation. Jesus loved those people, those who, who were hurting and, and crying out for help. We would say that Jesus loved the least and the last. He loved the lost. He loved people like you, and he loved people like me. You will remember that on one occasion, our Lord was having supper with some tax collectors and sinners, not exactly the most popular group of that particular day. And many of the Pharisees were just appalled that Christ would associate, much less eat with such people. They couldn't believe it. Jesus' words must have hit them like a ton of bricks when he said the words that are found in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 12. The Bible says, when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus came for the sick. 
Not only did he come for the sick, but listen, he came for those who realize that they were sick. There are a lot of people today who are spiritually sick, but they don't even know it. They cannot see it through uh, their eyes that are filled with pride. These Pharisees could not see their sin as well. Christ was always burdened for those who were hurting. And we should reach out to the heavy-hearted like Jesus. After all, if we want to be like Him, and if we want to walk in His footsteps, and we want to imitate our Savior, then we must do what He did. We must ask God to give us a heart that is heavy for those who are hurting. And as Christians, you'll notice that it's our responsibility to help those who are overwhelmed by a crisis. It's not something that is optional, but it's something that is mandatory. It is a call that God has placed upon our lives. In fact, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus reminds us that when we see those who are hungry or those who are sick, or when we see those who are in prison, or those who are without clothing, that when we love them and we help them, it's as if we are doing it to our Savior, Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 25, in verse 35, the Bible says it like this, For I was hungry, Jesus says, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger to you, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, As surely I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it. To me, Such powerful words for us today. You know what I believe this morning? I believe that people aren't looking for the biggest church with the tallest steeple. I believe what they're looking for are people who take the time and the chance to love them right where they are. And they help them to get where they need to be in life. And the question this morning is that you... Is that me? Could we say that's us? Is that who we are as the people of God? Well, it's in this parable that Jesus is speaking directly to the Pharisees. And he tells about a man who was robbed and stripped and wounded. He was left for dead. And he wants them to see themselves, not as the man who was on the side of the road. And he does not want them to see themselves as the the good Samaritan but he wants them to see themselves as the two men who left him there to die. And so as we think about the parable of the Good Samaritan this morning, I want you to notice some things that we discover in this text. The first thing I want you to see here in verses 25 through 28 is the big question. Notice the big question here in verse 25. The Bible says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. The man asked the question this particular day, happened to be a lawyer, Most people tell us he was probably a scribe. And he approached Jesus about salvation, but most scholars believe that he had ulterior motives. He probably heard Christ teach, and he decided to ask him a question to try to make him stumble. We see that throughout God's Word, where different religious leaders would try to make Jesus stumble. It's interesting, you didn't really see that much among the the non-religious crowd, it was always the religious crowd that was trying to get Jesus to, to stumble along the way. But can I say today, you cannot make the, the Son of God stumble in His theology. Christ used this as a teaching lesson. Because in many public places, this was a hot topic that was highly debated and discussed. Jesus sent this expert of the law back to the law, not because the law saves, but because the law reveals and the law convicts. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 16, the apostle Paul is writing to 
to those believers in Galatia. And he says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have been believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. The law is simply a mirror that points us to the grace of God. Jesus knew the heart of this man, just like he knows your heart, just like he knows my heart. And he had been disobedient to these great commandments that he mentions. He knew them in his head, but he failed to follow them with his heart. You see, he had quoted them with his lips, and they, they flowed easily uh, out of his mouth, but he never expressed them with his life. Sounds like a lot of Christians today, he had them memorized, but, but they were not lived out through the power of God. And the way that we know that we belong to God is not just because we prayed a prayer somewhere along the way and we followed Him in believer's baptism. We know that we belong to God by the love that we have for Him and the love that we have for other people. It's that love that tells us that what Paul said in Romans chapter 5, that somewhere along the way that God literally poured His love into our hearts. And it is expressed through the love that we have for our Heavenly Father, but it doesn't stay there. That flow, that, that love flows through our lives to other people, and so we express it to our Heavenly Father first, but it flows through our lives to other people as well. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, we find that John spoke about love all of the time. We could say John's theme was really love. And in 1 John 3.10, the Bible says, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Do you realize that the term, love your neighbor as yourself, is found several times in the Bible? In fact, eight different times you will find this phrase. The lawyer used an old debating tack when he said, define your terms. You'll notice what he says. Uh, who is my neighbor? Look what he says here in verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he, speaking of Jesus, said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. You'll notice that Jesus hit him right in the heart because many of the Jews were known for only accepting Jews. They had a very small circle. And they would not accept anyone outside of that circle. They would often say, Something like this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, except all Gentiles, for they are not our neighbors, but those only that are our nation and religion. That was their, their motto. That's what they lived by. You know, the same narrow-mindedness is alive today. May God break us of this and help us to see that that everyone is our neighbor, no matter where they live or, or, or where they may reside. That even those who are different than us, whether it's a different religion or whether they live in a different part of the world, it does not matter. God wants us to realize that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Notice the big question. But also we find the big test, don't we? Because in Luke chapter 10, look at verse, nine, uh, verse 29 rather through 35. The Bible says, But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. 
Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Not only do we find the big question, but here we find the big test. As Jesus makes his case, he describes what would have been a real life occurrence. You've heard me say along the way that, that these parables connected to the people in which Jesus was teaching. They knew about this situation. He, intru- he introduces them to three men. All of them saw this poor, battered man, but only one of them was willing to see about his condition. You see, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a dangerous path. Jerusalem is about 2,300 feet above sea level. Jericho is about 1,300 below sea level. And in less than 20 miles, there was about a a 3,600 feet drop. It was a road that was covered with a lot of rocks. It had a lot of twists. It had a lot of turns. It was extremely narrow. And we're told that on this dangerous road, there were a lot of thieves. There were a lot of predators who were looking for someone to rob, and they did on most occasions. This particular path that Jesus is talking about in this parable was known as the Red Way. It was known as the Bloody Way. And as we look around, we see many people who have also fallen in what we would call the ditch or the road of life. They need for someone to take a risk. They need for someone to to help them out of the ditch. They need someone to to help them in their situation. Jesus reminds these particular Pharisees of something that happened all the time during their day as someone would take this path and they would be robbed or they would be hurt. As you think about that, we discover three different kinds of people that, that saw what had taken place. We, we see them going on this particular journey, yet only one of them does something about what they have seen. Only one of these men helped this poor man. He was the least likely. You'll notice that he was not the the priest that is mentioned here in this parable. You would have thought that the priest would have at least stopped and and checked on him. It was not the the Levite. He continued on his own path, and and he probably saw him, but he he didn't do anything. It was a Samaritan. A Samaritan, the least likely of all three, was the one who stopped And he helped him. I want you to look in our text this morning how extensive his care was of this particular man. Look at verse 34 here in Luke chapter 10. The Bible says, So he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to an innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. I want you to think about how wonderful his hospitality was to this particular person who had been hurt, who had been beaten, and who had been left there on the side of the road. I want you to see the the big test that God has given to us. Whenever I was in seminary, my very first semester, my very first class that I took uh, was one on the parables of Jesus. That's really the class that gave me a heart for for the parables that that Jesus taught. And one of the exercises in in that class was that we had to rewrite uh, the parables, but we had to rewrite those parables in our own words. You know, to apply it to today, something that would happen. And I had the privilege of actually rewriting this particular parable, not that it needs to be rewritten, but a modern-day parable may go something like this. When there was a woman who was traveling from Washington to Richmond who had a flat tire, 
She was stranded on the side of the road, and after raising the hood of her SUV and and tying a white scarf to her radio antenna, she locked the door handles and sat in the car, and she prayed that God would send help. By chance, there was an extended cab pickup truck that came by, and it had a bumper sticker that said, Smile, God loves you. And when the driver saw the stranded woman, he passed by in the far lane. And there was another family that came by. They were in a brand new Yukon. They had a bumper sticker. It read, Honk, if you love Jesus. And they also drove around the lady when they saw her. Finally, there was a young man. He was in his early 20s. He was traveling back to college after being home for the weekend. And he drove an old car. He had no bumper sticker on, the, on, the, on his car. He stopped and he offered to change the lady's flat tire. He took out the spare. He jacked up the car. He removed the, the flat tire and he replaced it with the spare. And when he finished, the woman tried to pay him, but he refused the money. He then returned to his old bumper sticker less car. He smiled. He honked at her. And he went his way. The question this morning is the same question that Jesus posed. Which of these three was a neighbor? May God help us to be like this college student and the Samaritan who both helped when there was someone in need. Every single day we probably are faced not only with the big question, but we are faced with the big tests in our busy lives, as we open them, our eyes, and we look around, there's opportunity after opportunity and some way to not drive on the other side of the road, but to go right where the need may be and to ask God to help us or others to help us as well to do what we can to make a difference for Jesus Christ. I want you to notice not only the big question and the big test, but I want you to notice the big command. Look here in Luke chapter 10 and verses 36 and 37. The Bible says, So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Jesus left no room for wonder. There was no guesswork. There was no speculation. He had proven his case. He could identify his neighbor. And I want you to see that Christ wanted him to realize that that we must stop and help those who have fallen. The scribe and the others were guilty of being just like the priests and the Levites. And not like the Samaritan. Isn't it something that Jesus was pointing the priest and the Levite to become like the Samaritan? And so it is for us today that Jesus is wanting us to see who our neighbor is, who it is that is hurting, and to follow his example as well. Jesus was speaking to them and he speaks to us if we are guilty of such hypocrisy and sin. Because in 1 John chapter 3 and verses 17 and 18, the Bible says, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Jesus calls us to go to our neighbor. Look at verse 36. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? It is a call to go to our neighbor. And our neighbor is anyone who has fallen down on this road that we call life. We are to stop. We are to pick them up. We are to help them along the way. The parable was told to show that many times we are just like them. And God wants us to be like the Samaritan here in this parable. I want you to notice the command as we close. Because here in verse 37, as Jesus concludes this parable, He always was willing to draw in the net. And you'll notice in verse 37, the Bible says, And He said, He who showed mercy on him... 
And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The command of the parable, the purpose of the parable is for us to go and do likewise. To follow the example of the Samaritan and to look for people who need help and to love them like Jesus has loved us. Now, I believe there's some ways that we can live this out this morning. There's some questions that, that we need to answer that are extremely practical today. The first question is this, who do you see? Because as we think about this Samaritan, he saw this man who was on the side of the road. As you think about your life, the places that you go, and the things that you experience, who has God placed in your life right now? Because He puts people on our path. And He wants us to, to slow down for a moment. He wants us to, to look around. And so I want you to, to let that question kind of soak in for a moment. Who do you see? Who, who is that person or are those persons that God has put in your circle of influence that He is wanting you to help in Christ's name. And maybe you can't help them, but maybe you can call on other Christians to help you to help them. Many times that's the way that it works. Who do you see? Who comes to mind? But there's a, another way that we can live it out. Not only answer the question, who do you see? But what do they need? What do they need? What is it that they lack? Maybe God wants you just to have a conversation with them and to assess their needs, to learn more about what they're going through and, and how you can help them in a better way, to simply take a good look, to take a closer look. Who do you see? What do they need? And thirdly, how can you help? This man helped. He was able to do a lot of different things in our passage to help this man uh, specifically in what he was going through. What can you do? How can you make a difference? Uh, perhaps it involves networking with other Christians. But how can you help for us to see the needs and to not do anything at all or to do what we normally do, to shake our heads and, and maybe uh, say a prayer for them, but not to put any action with our prayers is truly a terrible thing. May God help us to not only see the need and pray about the need, but listen, may we do something to meet that need through the power of Christ and in Jesus' name. Who do you see? What do they need? And how can you help? And this morning, as we close, I want to say to you, if you have never trusted Christ, as your Savior and Lord, can I say that all of us spiritually have fallen on the road uh, called life in our sins. And we cannot get up off of the ground. We cannot help ourselves. But over 2,000 years ago, a Savior came to this world. He stepped in and to help us. And He's able to lift us out of our situation. He's able to forgive us of our sins. He's able to wash them with His precious blood. He's able to do what we cannot do for ourselves. I want to encourage you to ask Him into your life to be your Savior and your Lord. This morning, if you want to, to talk to someone about your decision, I, I would love for you to connect with us. You can go to our website, fbcy.com, and you can click on who we are. And I pray that you'll reach out to us. I want to hear from you. I want to pray for you. And I want to encourage you as well. And so let us know today about your decision as we think about the difference that Christ is making in your life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day, this Lord's day once again. And help us to take a parable, a story that we have heard probably many, many times. And Lord, help us to hear it today, receive it today, to obey it today as if it is the very first time. Father, may we not just know about this parable and to be able to, to, to tell the, the parts of it as well. But Lord, help us to heed what Jesus said, to go and to do likewise. 
And so, Father, help us to, to know who it is that you want us to see. Help us to see their needs. And help us to ask how we can help. Father, get us out of our small circle. And help us as a church, as we've done so many times, to look outside of these four walls and to find needs, hear of needs, address needs, and to be the people of God, not only on this campus, but, but throughout this community. And Father, as I close today, thank you for those who have gone to Lake Charles to, to help clean up and to put tarps on roofs. Lord, thank you for those who have gone just south of Youngsville to, to help put tarps on mobile homes. Father, thank you for those who have given recently to help a family in Youngsville that flooded. Thank you for this church that understands the powerful command to go and to do likewise. May we continue to be a people that look beyond the four walls of this church. May we be the church that goes to people as we love them in Jesus' name. We pray this in your powerful, powerful name. The name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.